Okay, I think the mic is, is working. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, today we'll be, go, we'll be, I will be talking about how we are building a GraphQL uh, API proxy on, on top of uh, existing REST endpoint. This is the, the schema we are, we are using at, at Sing. My name is uh, Alexis Mas. I'm working as a software engineer uh, at Sing in Hamburg. And you can find me on, on Twitter if you have any questions after the talk. Feel free to ping me there. The reason why we are doing this is basically because the company is, is, is growing and there is a clear tendency that this will continue to be the same on the following years. But not only the staff is growing, also the, the amount of uh, applications. Uh, this, this is uh, not all of them, this is just a, a small piece of, of the big picture. All of the, these small lines you are seeing, the purple, the greenish, and the gray ones, they are different kind of endpoints. So if you are working on one application, there could be some chances that you need to maintain the different three kinds of different endpoints. So obviously we want to reduce the integration effort, we want to move faster, and why not have awesome tooling. Currently, uh, we closed the MVP status, uh, MVP phase, two days ago. Um, we integrated one of the products with the, the schema, with mutations and queries. So right now, we are moving towards the minimum level product. In this phase, we want to, inter to focus on improving the, the, the workflow for the, for the developers. And a bit more of context before going into the technical part. Um, our proxy is meant to be used uh, internally only. It's only for mobile and web, so this means no inter backend communication. And we still use REST as the primary way to expose the internal APIs. Uh, also, we, we, don't, we don't expose the, the schema for unauthenticated requests. So if you want to do a request, you, each, you have to be authenticated as a specific user. And finally, with the idea on, on, on our project is to keep it as slim as possible. We don't want to do any kind of remapping between the, how the things are named on the backend or how the things are named on the frontend. If you want to use a different name on the, fro on the frontend, you can use an, an alias. So on the architecture side, this is how we look like. Uh, we, we expose two different endpoints, one for mobile requests, another one for web requests. The main reason of doing this, uh, we, we already have a, a current implementation of, uh, of the mobile, uh, mobile APIs called XWS, and inside there we do all the authentication. All the OAuth uh, handling and the OAuth flow is implemented there, so we didn't, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And then on, on the, for the web clients, we just handle the, the request and we validate the cookie. And then we, we do the pertinent rest, uh, rest uh, calls to the different nodes or services. Uh, our project is called Sing1, and internally it looks something like this. Uh, we are using ACA HTTP uh, to handle the incoming, uh, incoming requests. Then we pass to the authenticator, which do some checks to see if the request is properly authenticated. If so, we uh, rely on Sangria to do the actual schema validation. And finally, we are using Finagle to communicate with the underlying REST endpoint. Uh, the things that go from the authenticator to Finagle, we are calling it the GraphQL engine, which require different pieces to put everything together in order to do the REST call. The first thing of all uh, is the, the authenticator, which depends of Obviously, the channel. So, we see if, web, if it's web, we use one. If it's mobile, we use another one. Also, we have some special case that for development, we are allowing uh, only on preview and on development. Uh, you, as a front end developer, you can uh, authenticate yourself just setting, uh, uh, adding an HTTP header with, some, with a user ID value. The next thing uh, we need to know is the schema. Uh, also, we need to rely on Sangria to, okay, uh, execute the query using the schema on this way. But uh, besides that, we also need, uh, we need some context. We need to know uh, the context we'll be in charge of uh, doing the orchestration in the different things. We will see later how the uh, internal looks like. The next thing we have uh, are the middleware providers. These allow, it is the, are depending on, on the channel, on the environment. This allows us to enable or, or disable certain features depending of, of, on, on the context. 
and last but not least we are we also have uh, some query reducers uh, in this case they only change depending on the environment for production we have one configuration and for preview we have another one um, for example the middleware providers uh, currently we have three cases uh, for the mobile uh, we are uh, we are loading slow load and fierce climbing fierce, fierce, uh, the fierce climbing is only for mobile each time you request uh, using a, a query using the, resem the, the mobile endpoints you need to uh, apply some hashing to the, to the ID. So the fields can be we validate the hashing and remove it if it's valid. Otherwise, you will see an, an error and the query won't be able to be executed. Then uh, we are using slow log in both cases, in mobile and web. Uh, so the developers, uh, when, when, once they, they enter the, the login system we, we have, they know all the, profili the profiling details of the query. So they, they can be able to detect bottlenecks on, for, for each request. And then the difference uh, about the environment, uh, we can, um, on preview, we are also using slow load, but then we are relying on GraphQL specific, uh, request specific extensions. This allows us to inject the, the output of slow load into the query itself. So on graphical, just doing uh, one click, you know all the profiling details of your query. Then the other type are only environment specific uh, query reducers. Uh, in your case, we are using three. One, we are, uh, the field reducer, we are using it in both cases. The field users, uh, field users re reducer, uh, this allows us to know uh, which fields are we using and how many times. And so there is no, big, no change for in this case between environments. And this, the next two, the query complexity and the query depth reducers, uh, the only change are the threshold. So on, on preview, you will have to choose to process and, and execute um, queries with a higher uh, complexity level or the deep uh, or deeper queries. And finally, the request context uh, is what graphs all the different parts in order to do the, the, intern, the actual REST, uh, REST calls. The first thing we need to keep track of is the execution, execution context so we can rely on Scala concurrency. The next thing we need to do is to build the actual HTTP request, but in order to do that, we also need to rely on the field reducer. Uh, what the field reducer does, uh, basically transverse the, the AST tree of the query and create uh, um, a set of, of the different fields we need to, to ask on, on the backend. Uh, this is very important for, for batching. Once we have the, uh, the HTTP request in place, we hand it over to the REST client. Uh, we are using Finagle for, for that case, and basically what uh, Finagle does or allows us to do is to have a different amount of services. Uh, basically, uh, you can define some some root prefixes and use one service or another. So for example, you can use one service for messages, another service for uh, profiles, another service for uh, images. Each service will have uh, its own circuit breaker configuration, its own retries configuration, and also we keep track of it, its own metrics in, in isolation. This uh, basically allows to make the whole platform uh, re resilient. So in order to make it resilient, uh, the first thing we, we did was to overload it on purpose. Um, we used uh, Gatlin to do some uh, stress testing, uh, long running simulation uh, with uh, request, uh, re request spikes. Uh, we also simulated uh, connection errors. At the beginning, everything was okay, but then we found out that at some point, uh, the query started to be slower and slower, and eventually we were uh, starting to suffer timeouts on the, on the front end side. So um, Gatling gave us the first hint that something was uh, going on there. And then it's where we switched uh, Akai HTTP to use Finagel. We took that decision as there was, we didn't see an easy fix to this issue, and we were on an early phase of, of the project. The other thing we, it helped us in finding this is the metrics. We know uh, at, at every time what is going on under the hood. We have uh, metrics for all the nodes, CPU usage, 
memory usage, uh, how many times the garbage collection is being triggered. So this is really important to do some serious profiling. The next thing you want to keep in mind uh, and you want to have on, about metrics, you want to know how many time you are, you are spending. Uh, once you get uh, a query, you get a, a request, how the whole workflow, how much time you, are, you need to process everything and send the, the response back to the user. Uh, in this case, you are seeing the metrics for the web channel. We also have it for the mobile channel. So it allows us to quickly detect if we have some differences in, in one feature that could be interfering with the performance of the overall situation. Well, if we continue talking about metrics, we also have, you also want to know what is going on with the REST communication. Uh, you want to know at every time how many requests per second you are doing, how many requests are filing, uh, the, la the, the latency of, of the request, uh, are, are you getting a, a, a response on time or you are, you are it, it taking too long, you are having timeouts or not. And then uh, this is for example the internal tools we are using, uh, it's called Logsham, so when you, you can see all the login information. Uh, in this case, uh, this is what you will see for one query. Uh, the first three lines, you see that that query triggered three, three REST uh, uh, requests. And for each request, you will see the actual query, the fields it took, uh, the, how, how much time it took to be resolved. And finally, you will see the output of slow load. So you know uh, the different, uh, how, ma how many time, how much time do you require on each node and one other part of metrics is uh, the field usage. Uh, this, for example, is the, fees, the field usage uh, over, a, over five, five minutes uh, time lapse. This allows us to do two things, mainly to know for sure that if we are deleting one field, uh, that field is not being used. And the second thing is allows to know uh, which are the most used fields in order to see if there are room for, for uh, optimizations. So now that uh, things uh, started to fail, we want to fail fast. Why we want to do that? Because we want to provide the users with a quick feedback, and also we want to reduce the load from, from the underlying endpoints. So the first thing we need to have in mind is timeouts. Uh, we don't want to, to have one generic timeout for all the different endpoints. Uh, each timeout has to be shaped by the underlying API. So depending of, on the endpoint we are speaking, we are speaking to, we will, we will want to define one value or another one. For messages or on a chat-like application with a very small payload, one second could be a good value. Uh, for other more generic purpose endpoint like uh, retrieving data for a profile, two seconds could be a good value. Or if you want to upload a, an image, five seconds could be a reasonable value. Obviously, this is just a, an example. Uh, what is, it, it could help you to define the most accurate value for your platform, obviously, is doing, having some metrics in place, knowing how much time the actual uh, endpoints are taking to respond. So now we know how long to wait to throw a timeout, a timeout error. We need to know how, how, after how many errors we need to start to re reject all the, all the queries. And this is where a, a, circuit, breaker, uh, a circuit breaker comes in. A circuit breaker uh, allows you to detect failures and to prevent application from trying to perform a request that is doomed to fail. Uh, basically, a circuit breaker with, uh, has three states. When it's closed, everything is good. So we forward, we allow the request to hit the actual, the actual endpoint. Uh, once uh, the, the server returns an error, we increment, uh, you increment the, uh, an error counter. Once the error counter reach a certain threshold, you move to the open state. In the open state, every, every request you receive, you reject it immediately. This will uh, provide you a, a quick feedback to the user uh, no, with okay, something went wrong, and I love you to give some time to the underlying endpoint to recover. Once you are on the open state, you can, uh, you, you, after a certain amount of time, you pass to the half open state. In this case, you will 
let one request go to the online endpoint and depending of, on, the risp, on the response, you will, you will be back again and open or close. If the request is, if the response is successful, successful you will be, you close the circuit breaker so everything is back as, be, uh, as was before. If not, you go to the open state again, you continue rejecting everything, and again, after the timeout, you try to, to see again if the server recover. So now that we are failing, uh, things start to, to go wrong, we need to be clear about what failed. Because many things can go wrong and will go wrong. Uh, we have two main kind of uh, error types. Uh, one is the partial ones, that this means that you do some requests and you will get some day, daily data back. The rest, you won't get anything. But you will get the error saying, okay, you didn't get this because of this reason. And then the fatal errors are the ones that uh, prevent the query to being executed at all. You, are, you don't have the right credentials, the query is, not, is malformed, something like that. So it looks something like this. Uh, basically, the interesting part here, uh, this is a fatal error. You get the, the data, but it's null, so you have nobody the data. And on the error side, we are extending the GraphQL error specification, adding basically two fields. One is the ID, so the front-end developers know exactly uh, what it will run, so they can decide what to do. And then we are adding the details. We are, when we meant, we try to provide some kind of contextual information about the error. And then the next kind of errors uh, are the mutation ones. Uh, in this case, at the beginning, we, we followed the same approach as the error I, I just showed you. But the, the front end guys weren't, weren't were too, too happy about it. Uh, they didn't, they had to check in one place for the error, they had to check uh, in other place for the mutation, they need to know which is an operational error and, it, and which is a validation error. So uh, after discussing it with them, we, we decided to put the error, uh, the validation errors on the payload. This allowed them to know quickly if the mutation failed because of some validation. If you are working on a sign up form, if the email doesn't have the right format, you will see the error here. And then, for example, the SYNID module here uh, on, in the, under the hood will do a REST call, but if we, if we have an, an error, we abort the, the resolution. So we, we, we abort the, the REST uh, resolution. And that's it on my side. If you have any question, feel free to do it.